So that leads me to executive compensation. And while I, I understand uh, the governor's viewpoint about the, the psychic um, <laughs> return, there's, you know, we're also operating in a world where there are careers and people are in professions and they themselves have families uh, that they need to take care of. And I would hate to see us try to save uh, hundred thousand dollars or, or, or fifty thousand uh, dollars because it looks good politically uh, but it it reduces our uh, our ability to go after the very best leaders and you know I, we're not we're not trying to spend money wild, wildly around here we're doing everything we can to save money but if we try to save a little bit of money be, on our leaders, our leadership, uh, I think we are going to lose lots and lots of money uh, uh, on the, in, in the future. And what I would, I'm, what I'm not, I'm not proposing that we try to use state money to, to uh, for executive compensation. But we have been establishing a model. Um, where we are able to raise private money from donors who are very interested in having the very best leadership um, who will supplement uh, that compensation. And all, all I'm asking is that um, if we do that, if we're able to, to cap compens executive compensation from the state at a certain amount, and are able to increase that with private funds that you not then tear us apart uh, for for trying to, to do the best we can because we are going to need the best leadership that we can get to get through these next few years. Thank you. Could I respond to that since that was directed to me and it's good to have a dialogue here. Um, I agree leadership counts and I would underscore that but I wouldn't characterize this concern of mine as looking good politically, unless, unless by political you mean political in the largest sense of the word, the health of the polis, the health uh, of the community, of, of, um, of our whole society, of the union, trying to keep it together. So there's a moral issue here. So getting it from the private sector doesn't really overcome my biggest concern. Uh, obviously, salaries at the top are relatively small, um, but the, the, I'm concerned that the university uh, gets caught in this process where institutions that are aimed at upward mobility actually um, reconfirm and more deeply embed the very stratification and the trends toward uh, greater stratification that we're already experiencing. So uh, I'm not trying to I don't know, really attack or make you look bad, but I just have to tell you from my life experience, my upbringing, my training, maybe I spent too long with vows. I did take a vow of poverty. I'm sorry, I did that. Uh, solemn vows, matter of fact. In fact, it has, it's, it was an, it, it's a perpetual vow, but the Pope um, absolved me from executing it after I left the seminary, but I still still runs around in my head here. And not that I want to make anybody poor, I want people to get rich. But um, if we don't have a tight knit, if our society pulls apart too much, as it is, we're going to have a very hard time governing. You heard the group from Ask Me make their pitch. And that's playing or working with this theme that is haunting all of us. So I know you can't change the global economy or the effects of technology on, on the distribution of income, but we just have to be mindful of it. And that's why I use the phrase uh, servant uh, leadership. Uh, oh, I, I did want to, I started to talk about the uh, book uh, University in Ruins by Professor Reading from Canada, no longer alive, and I, I uh, didn't make the point that I wanted. He said in that book, um, excellence 
has no referent. It's a self, uh, it's a term internal to the university. Uh, and I think the same thing applies to excellence. It's a term everybody invokes. But here's a man, serious professor, writing a book, and he's, he's questioning, uh, where, uh, I understand smarter is better than dumber, and you know, more productive is better than less productive, but the word quality, uh, you know, is that how many times your paper is uh, cited in footnotes? Or, you know, what, this quality is more problematic than we, we acknowledge. So I just, that was the point I wanted to make on the University of Ruins. Uh, the next point I want to make, uh, coming in the more recent period, um, if you go back to, well, this is not recent, but if you go back to uh, 1870, 1880, the minority of teachers at Harvard and Yale had PhDs. They didn't have PhDs. Uh, the requirements and the curricula for undergraduate uh, was very different, and the relationship between the professional schools to the undergraduate was very different. Um, people became doctors, didn't do an undergraduate PA. And then this, this all it changes. Uh, we've had lots of changes in general studies. Um, higher education, uh, given the else, is not static. It changes. It has a tradition, uh, but it also has, uh, we have to adapt. I mean, it's almost like, you know, we have the, the, our DNA moves very slowly over millions, billions of years, but then we adapt by changing the environment. So we're adapting here, but we want to maintain the basic DNA uh, of the university. And this business of rankings, I have to say, I, when I read the, looking through the audit report for UCSF, by the way, I was just reading it in my spare time, and I noticed they quote the U.S. News and World Report about how the children's program is fifth or the other is the top. Well, I don't look to Mr. Uh, what's his name, Zuckerberg, who I know, as my uh, mentor here. Um, these rankings, they take all these different factors and they congeal them into one number, and they say you're five or ten or twenty. Uh, I think the University of California and California is big enough that we set the rankings. Now, I know you got a market, and people say, I'm not coming to California because Texas will pay me more, or we get more research and more assistance. Well, those are all true, so I'm not trying to deny the world as it is. I'm just saying that this is a very powerful state, and this is a very powerful university. So we have to lead. I like that. I, we want to lead. And I'm not saying exactly how to do that. I'm telling you, I am engaged in this challenge with you, not against you. And, you know, they made me back in 18, they made the governor the president of the regents back there in, in 1868 for some reason. And I'm researching that now. I want to find out why the hell they want the governor here. But evidently somebody did. So here I am. And I want to work through this stuff. Now, let me make two practical points because people always say I'm thinking global. Let me get down to the specifics. Online is, is one pathway. Where it leads, we don't know. But let's let's go for it. Um, Riverside Medical Program. I, I got to be concerned. I am concerned. I haven't bought off on that yet. Um, uh, we hear about uh, the Obamacare. What's that going to do to the medical system? How are you going to fare? Is that going to change your cost structure? I, I get nervous. And now you want to take on another one. Maybe it's not a hospital. Maybe it's a medical program. You you have to be careful. And you got to look down the road. The university. A lot of smart people here, but you went on a pension holiday for a long time. So not everything, not everybody who's so smart always makes the right decisions. That's why we have a lot of different people around here to collaborate. So hopefully we minimize um, our, our mistakes. So there it is. You, you kind of look at that Riverside Medical Program. Uh, look at online. And I, I just want to reiterate about research because obviously some implications you can infer that I'm looking for cost savings across a wide swath and research wouldn't be exempt from that. Uh, I like research. I like the new. Uh, but I want to distinguish new, uh, genuinely new knowledge from novelty. And I think this, so I don't want to judge. I know this is academic freedom and we, I don't want to 
uh, you know, angels fear to tread. I'm not going to jump into your into your process here, um, but but I do want to say I like ideas of research. You know, I don't want to put all the money on a rat hole of incarceration, and I don't even want to put a, all the money taking care of characters like me. And I'm going to get more costly. Okay, so we got to but we got to balance it. How much do we take care of the poor? How much do we care of the elderly? How much for locking up people? How much for rehabilitating drunks and dr drug addicts? And how much brilliant, excellent, elite people who are going to pioneer all these great things? Well, I'm investing, I'm pushing, and John helped us, high-speed rail. A lot of people are scared. Oh, high-speed rail. I can just find $65 billion when I'm quibbling about a medical program. Well, we got to, you know, we got to chew gum and jump rope at the same time. We've got to invest in new things that can lead to greater wealth later. We need, we need a delta facility to assure water. If we don't put up $14 billion to assure water quality, and we get an earthquake, you could cut off 50% of the water to Santa Clara County, and that Silicon Valley, we would not recover. So certain things, you've got to think big, you've got to invest, and you've got to think down the road. Just like climate change, people don't want to invest in climate change. That's the big equalizer. We keep getting deeper in debt, more inequality, and then the climate uh, ups the cost. So all I'm saying is, with all these big uh, concerns out there, let's move carefully, let's look at all the collective wisdom here, and through this uh, wonderful process, let's make the best um, decisions we can possibly make. And I pledge that my mind is open. Okay, I believe if you know where you're going, you're already dead. So I confess, and I'll write about it in the paper and I'll pay for it. I don't know where I'm going, but I know I'm going to get there.